Good evening, good evening, everyone. We welcome you to our Bible study here at Sarah Norwood Calvary Baptist Church on a Wednesday night. And uh, it's good to uh, be able to be here. Many of you know we've got this uh, storm running around uh, up in Central and, and North Florida, and we continue to pray for those who are uh, being affected and uh, that hopefully things will calm down and be well uh, after the wind stops blowing. But uh, we are here to uh, go ahead and... and dive into uh, God's word tonight. I'm going to ask our Reverend Legister if you can open us in a word of prayer, please. Let us pray. Father, we are indeed thankful for your mercy and your grace. We here in this, this area of Florida are happy that the storm didn't come our way, but we feel it and pray for our brothers and sisters up north who are who have experienced it and uh, those who are still experiencing it at this time and ask for your deliverance and protection of them and their properties and uh, we ask that father even out of this some will come to consider their relationship with you and realize that they need you and that they need to turn to you and find real refuge and strength even in this life in which we find ourselves. Thank you for this moment we are spending together as we look into your word and we just ask that you continue to give us guidance and direction so that we will indeed benefit by developing and growing our thoughts and our consideration of your word and what it means to us and how we should use it in the appropriate manner to reach out to others. So guide our speaker this evening and the rest of us who are on the program. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, and uh, tonight, uh, as we have in the past, we have uh, Reverend Chisholm with us tonight. You, you don't see him on here, but he's here uh, by phone. So, you know, if you if you speak, he will hear you and uh, have it in such a way that he you'll be able to hear him uh, as well. And uh, tonight we're going to, um, you know, think thinking about how you know in today's society they are trying to, you know, wipe out or push out the things that uh, uh, anything to do with with church and Christianity and Jesus Christ. And uh, what we're doing tonight is um, how the church, as a matter of fact, has had such a huge impact on Western civilization. So, you know, if, if they push out certain things, you know, they, um, they're pushing out the church, they have to push out other things as well that came with it. This, that's a good uh, summary there, Rev? Good enough. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going to, we have some uh, audio to play. And um, remember, if you have any questions or, or any, um, uh, any, any statements or observations, you can just, um, uh, stop me or uh, put up the hand gesture and we'll go ahead and stop and um, we will uh, go ahead and pause and take your question or statement. All right, give me one second. Many Christians, including church leaders, may not be aware of it, but the Church of Jesus Christ is under attack from many quarters, and more and more we hear lectures, speeches, or read books that highlight certain negative episodes in the Church's history, like the Spanish Inquisition and torture of people, the witch hunting, and as well complicity with the chattel slavery experience. There is also a popular query about the church's relevance in the modern world, and some even sustain and try to promote the view that the church's role in societies, even in the past, has been largely negative. I get the distinct impression when talking with Christians, especially those exposed to tertiary level training, that they register a tinge of embarrassment about the church, and possibly about being a Christian, 
because of the regularity with which they hear about the spots on the church's history. Part of this embarrassment, in my view, has to do with ignorance or forgetfulness of what the church, despite its faults, has done for societies in what is called the Western world and the ongoing debt that Western civilization owes to the church. My aim is to provide a historical sweep of the past 2,000 years with special emphasis on the positive role that the church has played in the transformation of Western civilization. The hope is that all of us may be encouraged to continue the transforming legacy of the church. Odd though it may be, I wish to begin with a definition of the church. The need for this is somewhat of a puzzle because we are all in a church. All or most of us are members of or associated somehow with a local church or a denomination called, let's say, the Baptist Church or Anglican Church. And we also refer to the members of a church as the church. And yet, that is the problem. The fluidity attached to the English word church. The situation is no easier if we go behind the English word church to probe the meaning in usage of the central Greek word ecclesia that has given rise to the English word church. This is so for two reasons. Firstly, ecclesia itself has fluidity in meaning in the New Testament documents. So ecclesia describes in Acts 19, 32 and 39 and 41, a gathering of tradesmen. In Romans 16, 4 and 5, a local group or groups of Christians. In 1 Corinthians 10, 32, all Christians on earth. And in Ephesians 2, 6 and 3, 10, possibly a trans-earthly or cosmic body of Christians. The central prevailing idea in the 114 references to Ecclesia is that of people constituting a kind of community. Secondly, the New Testament documents use a multiplicity of terms to describe the same entity called church. Terms such as those who believe, the brethren, body, family, temple, flock, etc. Even that popular expression on the lips of our Lord, kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, is suggestive of a term for the entity called church, as Kevin Giles argues. He says, quote, it has been pointed out that the term the kingdom of God primarily speaks of the dynamic rule of God. But as the thought of God ruling implies a people he rules over, the expression also can involve, in a secondary sense, the idea of realm. Thus, Jesus not only proclaims the kingdom of God, that is, God's dynamic reign, but also invites people to enter the kingdom of God, Matthew 18, 3, Mark 9, 47, Luke 16, 16, etc., which must mean deciding to recognize God's rule over one's life. Those who do this constitute a new community where the rule of God is of utmost importance and life-transforming. Yet the reign of God is not limited to this sphere." Unquote. It may be instructive, too, that in one of the only two places where Jesus uses the term ecclesia, Matthew 16, 18 to 19, it may arguably be used as a synonym for kingdom of heaven, which is also used in the text. Nonetheless, one has to agree that all the earthly Christian writers use ecclesia only for those fellowships which came into being after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. May I suggest then that for purposes of this presentation, we regard the church minimally as a plurality of persons forming a community who express faith in and allegiance to Jesus Christ. It is to such a community that the multifaceted mission of Jesus Christ is committed. If we seek justification for seeing such a community as God's means of transforming society, then such emerges from several passages. I wish now to explore these in brief compass, then spend the rest of the time 
on selected aspects of the legacy of societal transformation and challenge toward transformation left by the church over the past 2,000 years. Perhaps the fundamental text in this regard would be Matthew 28, 16 to 20, especially the central command to make disciples of all nations, verse 19. The suggestions are quite strong concerning societal transformation in both the central command, make disciples, and its stated extent of all nations. A disciple is one who mirrors in her life and ideas the life and ideas of her master. Put differently, the disciple mirrors in his character, concepts, and conduct whose he is. The ministry of genuine discipling is then transformational of the individual in terms of mind and life. And when a nation can be said to be discipled, meaning the majority of people have experienced this transformation, such a nation can hardly escape being transformed, or at least being challenged toward transformation. The revolutionary metaphors, salt of the earth and light of the world, used by Jesus of his disciples in Matthew 5, 13 to 16, are definitely transformational in societal terms. There are also hints of the transformational presence of God's community in parables such as the sower, Mark 4, 1 to 20, the mustard seed, Mark 4, 30 to 32, and the seed growing secretly, Mark 4, 26 to 29. Right, any questions, observations, statements? Before we move on to the next. All right, here we go, next one. We now look at a legacy of societal transformation and challenge toward transformation. Christians in the period from Pentecost to the fall of Rome challenged and at times progressively transformed the societal mores of the Roman Empire with reference to the value of human life and the virtue of sexual purity. I look now at the value on human life. That Roman culture placed very little value on human life is well known. Romans were not only accustomed to emperors like Nero, Domitian, Decius, and Diocletian, and other societal leaders who were murderous of rivals, whether Christians and even of family members. But the horrible gladiatorial games were as popular then as football is in many nations today. Each contest required men to fight men, commonly with the aim of killing the opponents with a sword. It was the crowd that largely decided the fate of a weakened, gasping gladiator. A turned thumb signal, usually given by women spectators, instructed the victor to go for the final blow. Often, it was the women who praised gladiators. The barbaric cruelty, the agonizing screams of the victims, and the flow of human blood stirred no conscience in the crowds of the gladiatorial events. To see a gladiator stab and slice his opponent to death was top-ranked amusement. Christians boycotted and denounced the games and attracted criticism. One critic of the Christians said, quote, you do not go to our shows. You take no part in our processions. You shrink in horror from our sacred games, unquote. Peter's call to live uprightly amidst slander and to suffer with pride for doing good and for being a Christian, 1 Peter 2, 12, and 3, 9 to 17, and 4, 12 to 19, may reflect the emerging trend of verbal attacks on Christians for being countercultural in lifestyle. The gladiatorial games were eventually banned owing to the influence of the church. As W.E.H. Leckie concludes, quote, there is scarcely any single reform so important in the moral history of mankind as the suppression of the gladiatorial shows, a feat that must be almost exclusively ascribed 
to the Christian church, unquote. Roman culture too, like several others in the ancient world, was completely at ease with infanticide and child abandonment, which the church opposed on biblical principles. Plutarch, roughly AD 46 to 120, says of the Carthaginians that they, quote, offered up their own children, and those who had no children would buy little ones from poor people and cut their throats as if there were so many lambs or young birds. Meanwhile, the mother stood by without a tear or moan, unquote. Even the philosopher Seneca, roughly 4 BC to AD 65, chief advisor to Nero said, quote, we drown children who at birth are weakly and abnormal, unquote. Christians did not only denounce the entrenched Greek and Roman cultural practice of child abandonment, but they also provided refuge for abandoned children. Infanticide and child abandonment were made capital offenses in 374 under the Christian Emperor Valentinian, who was influenced by Bishop Basil of Caesarea. Though infanticide was not completely wiped out, recurring in later centuries, the consistent opposition of the church is what has influenced anti-infanticide laws up to the present time. Crucifixion in the hands of the Romans approximated an art form, albeit a despicable one. And it was outlawed by Constantine owing to his high regard for the Christian cross. We look now at the issue of sexual morality. Christianity's elevation of sexual morality based on the Bible has exerted a tremendous transforming influence on societies ancient and modern. Whereas the Christian sexual ethic outlawed all sex acts except heterosexual monogamous acts, the conventions of the Roman Empire and not a few modern societies countenanced a no-holds-barred approach as people in general did sexually whatever, however, wherever, with whomever, or whatever. Not only is the evidence in literature, but also in archaeology. And these have turned up sexual graphics covering a wide spectrum of sexual acts on household items in the Roman Empire. All right. Any questions there, statements, observations? No. All right, we'll move on to the that next. That must one. have been an awful time to live, period to live in, with, with, with all of those gruesome killing and stuff like that. Boy. I, I, I wonder if we're getting back to that in this country now. And then worse so there's no there's no justice for it. That's it. It's not nobody's coming to say, all right, arrest this person or you know, hang this person because they committed murder because they killed it. Oh, it was just a Christian, so you know. Yeah, I, I, I think that I think that might be in our future, in a very near future, because um what what is going on in this country, the last bastion of the Christian faith. It is is um you know they're attacking the church and Christians now, uh, and and seeing us as as uh, hindrance in accomplishing their the, the things that they have set themselves to do and to become. Mm -hmm. When I say to that, sometimes nobody nobody likes to be told what they're doing is wrong. That's it, they, so... they, because they are so convinced in their own heart. And maybe not that you know, but they just see that uh, um, Christians is, is is a blocking in their way because yeah. we are the ones who are standing against abortion and all those kind of stuff. Uh, and and this is why I think um, we are going to be having some warm times in in the in the years to come if we might if the law tarries that long. Indeed. Yeah. 
All right, next one. Here we go. Now to the issue of charity and compassion. From the first century of this era to the present, the impact of the church's commitment to voluntary charity and compassion has been transforming in many societies. The rise of orphanages, homes for the aged, the Salvation Army, the various Catholic groups like Sisters of Charity and Missioners of the Poor, United Way, YMCA, YWCA, Teen Challenge, hospitals, mental institutions, the Red Cross, and in Muslim countries, the Red Crescent, and numerous other agencies for the care of needy human beings can be traced back to the Church of Jesus Christ. The whole approach to governmental social welfare that has developed in the West, and more recently in the East as well, is debtor to the Christian contribution and has been profoundly influenced by it. I look now at education. Living in post-slavery societies in the Caribbean, we all know of the church's novel contribution of education for the slaves, matching an earlier novel Christian practice of education for both sexes. The idea of tax-supported public schools and compulsory education seem to go back to Martin Luther, the reformer, in the 15th century. While graded education owes a debt to the Lutheran layman Johannes Thurm in the 16th century. Education for the deaf began in the late 18th century with three French Christians, and education for the blind got its most significant forward Philip, though not its origin, from another French Christian, Louis Braille, in the 19th century. The origin of the university is debatable, but it is beyond controversy that the oldest and most prestigious universities recognized as such had Christian roots. The University of Bologna, 1158, regarded by some as the first. The University of Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Heidelberg, and Columbia, etc. With that one, Rev, you're saying that um, most of the oldest and most traditional universities started through churches. Yeah, they were started by church leaders, all church people initially, and then for the general public. And if you if you can scrape out the moss of some of these prestigious universities, you see a plaque dedicated to the glory of God. Hmm. But they they, they, they want they want, no. they, they want to put all of that in the past. Yeah. And turn and turn these university upside down to be. Just a, a, a hellish place instead of uh, anything oh, else. <laughs> or progressive, as they call it. Right. They, they, don't, um, they don't admit the history of the origin of the institutions. They'd rather, you know, pull themselves away from any vestige of Christianity having any, any impact on them, their start, their origin, their development. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, and um, this will be the the final one for tonight. Cause we have a couple more, but we're going to carry those over to next week, God willing. All right, here we go. We now turn to modern science. Despite misconceptions that plague the public in general, as well as some in the scientific community, modern science not only had its experimental tap roots in the Judeo-Christian worldview of a purposive, orderly, created world. But, as one writer said, quote, virtually all scientists from the Middle Ages to the mid-18th century, many of whom were seminal thinkers, not only were sincere Christians, but were often inspired by biblical postulates and premises in their theories that sought to explain and predict natural phenomena, unquote. 
The names include Leonardo da Vinci, 1452 to 1519 in human physiology. Gregor Mendel, 1822 to 1884 in genetics. Nicolaus Copernicus, 1475 to 1543. Johannes Kepler, 1571 to 1630. And Galileo Galilei, 1564 to 1642 in astronomy. In physics, Isaac Newton, 1642 to 1727. Gottfried Leibniz, 1646 to 1716. Blaise Pascal, 1623 to 1662. George Simon Ohm, 1787 to 1854. Andre Ampere, 1775 to 1836. And Michael Faraday, 1791 to 1867. In chemistry, Robert Boyle, 1627 to 1691. Antoine Lavoisier, 1743 to 1794. George Washington Carver, approximately 1864 to 1943. And in medicine, Louis Pasteur, 1822 to 1895. And Joseph Lister, 1827 to 1912. It should be noted as well that the 19th to 21st century anti-God arrogance of some scientists continues to be deflated by certain God-pointing discoveries in the fields of biology, microbiology, and astronomy. In the field of biology and microbiology, the most significant mouth stopper and God pointer is the intricate design and information rich nature of all life forms, even so-called primitive life forms, and at the basic level of a cell. There is no more rational explanation for the origin of such intricate design and information than at least an intelligent designer. The alternative is to argue that both the design and the information evolved over time and by chance via mutations. There's a fatal flaw here though. Mutations may lead to benefits for an organism, but always or almost always involve a loss or a diffusion of information, never a gain of information. I want you to listen to a soundbite from a video which includes a biophysicist, Lee Spetner, and the atheist, Richard Dawkins. I want you to listen closely to the question put to Dawkins and the time lapse before his answer and also his answer. The information required for large scale evolution can really not come from random mutations. Uh, the Darwinian model says what it does, but nobody has ever made a calculation to show that it does. I've made a calculation that shows that it doesn't. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? There's a popular misunderstanding of evolution which says that uh, fish turned into reptiles and reptiles turned into mammals and, and so somehow we ought to be able to look around the world today and look, and look at our ancestors. We ought to be able to, to see the intermediates between fish and reptiles and between reptiles and mammals. We ought to be able to see fish kind of on the way to becoming reptiles. But of course that's not the way it is at all. Fish are modern animals. They're just as modern as we are. They're descended from ancestors which we're descended from. Way back 300 million years ago there would have been an ancestor which was the ancestor, of, of, the ancestor of modern humans. And that ancestor, if you could have been there then, you could have seen the first steps towards a fish, say, coming out onto the land and becoming, becoming a something like an amphibian. But that was a long time ago. You wouldn't expect to see that today. If one were to believe the Neo-Darwinian account, you would have to say that information is built up gradually in small steps, uh, a little bit at a time. And if one examines the, the mathematics of this sort of thing happening, it turns out that one has to assume that at any stage in evolution, that there are a large number of possible mutations that could occur that could be adaptive. 
And if there are a large number, we should be able to find some today. And the fact is that we don't. Dawkins could not find one solitary example of a mutation adding information to the gene pool. Without that, nothing can change into anything else of a radical different kind. For those of you in the scientific world, I would suggest you get a copy of Lee Spetner's 1997 book, Not By Chance, Shattering the Modern Theory of Evolution, which thoroughly demolishes the central arguments in Dawkins' book. Dawkins' book is The Blind Watchmaker, Why the Evidence of Evolution Reveals a Universe Without Design. But that's only the God-pointing evidence from biology. Astronomy's God-pointing evidence is also fascinating. The most abiding alternative to the biblical doctrine of a universe created in time by God has been the scientific notion that the universe is eternal, has no beginning, and therefore needs no beginner. In 1913, astronomer Vestus Slipher discovered that a dozen galaxies in the vicinity of Earth were moving away from the Earth at very high speeds, ranging up to two million miles per hour. This discovery led to the realization that the universe was expanding, which also meant that the universe had a beginning. The reaction to Slipher's discovery and the implications of that discovery for the origin of the universe provoked some odd reactions from scientists. Albert Einstein, in a letter to one of his colleagues, said, quote, This circumstance of an expanding universe irritates me, unquote. <laughs> Arthur Eddington, in 1931, said, quote, The notion of a beginning is repugnant to me. The expanding universe is preposterous, incredible. It leaves me cold, unquote. Alan Sandage, another astronomer, said concerning the evidence that the universe had a beginning, quote, it is such a strange conclusion, it cannot really be true, unquote. Now, none of these scientists has made a scientific statement. They're making emotive statements. The Cosmic Background Explorer satellite in 1992 provided additional confirming information on the nature of the origin of the universe. The findings of the satellite attracted the attention of major newspapers and TV programs across the world. George Smoot, project leader for the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, declared, quote, what we have found is evidence for the birth of the universe. It's like looking at God, unquote. Why don't we listen to the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heavens. Thou, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. The heavens declare the glory of God. Astronomer George Greenstein, in his book, The Symbiotic Universe, made this insightful comment, quote, as we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency, or rather agency with a capital A, must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? Unquote. But the cutest comment from an astronomer is from the book God and the Astronomers, written by the agnostic Robert Jastrow. He says, quote, a sound explanation may exist for the explosive birth of our universe, but if it does, science cannot find out what the explanation is. The scientist's pursuit of the past ends in the moment of creation. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there 
for centuries, unquote. All right, we're going to hold it there with the uh, audio for tonight. But uh, any questions, any comments, observations? And I know we've done some studies on this the creation and, and stuff before. And I think I may have said it then. Um, you know, and even with, within within our 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 Christian circles and stuff, you know, it, it, it always seems like it's uh God or science, you know. Um and sometimes we forget that uh God created science. So you know, I think that's something we can we can just remember when when you know people want to try to pit it against each other. Mm -hmm. And we were familiar with the history of science, as I mentioned just a little slide there. Many of the outstanding pioneer scientists were Christians, professing, practicing conservative Christians. They might not be from a Baptist church, but they were. Christians nonetheless, and they were not the DVD scientists, these were the seminal thinkers in the various disciplines. But people either are ignorant of their Christian background or their names. And so we talk quite a bit of nonsense, quite frankly, in scientific circles, as if only non-Christian scientists count as scientists. Or, or that scientists aren't Christians at all. That's right. As if you can't find any scientist of renown who is a Christian. Ignorance is at the foot of the root of that. I heard mention that um, two of our brothers studying at University of Florida are in law, my primary discipline of law. We are going to look at law and how Christianity has impacted law as we move on to the next this is next week god willing all right and then and you know especially with things going on these days the law is more and more important i mean not that it was le less important but you know understanding it is more and more right. important mm -hmm. all right anybody question comments observation No. All right. Well, we'll we'll hold it there. Um just want to remind you, God willing, this Sunday is um first Sunday and we'll be having communion. And for those who may be going out of town for the Labor Day weekend, we uh wish you safe travels and uh, that you will return um return safely as well. And I know the kids are looking forward to this weekend because even though they just started school, they get a holiday already. That's right. <laughs> so I know I used to always love that. Get a little break. Um, yeah, some of them might be asking, do we have to go back? <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, sure, we're done already. Good. Yeah. So, uh, and with that, all right, we'll uh, go ahead and close off. Reverend Chisholm, you mind closing us in a word of prayer, please, sir? No problem, brother. Let's pray. Sovereign God, creator of all humanity, all existence, and of the world. We bless you for your insights that you have given to human beings who are humble enough to trust you for guidance in developing scientific theories and other theories. Thank you for the impact of your church of Christianity in our modern world and in the ancient world. And Lord, we pray that we ourselves will become so acquainted with the basic information shared tonight that we can point people who tend to be anti-God and anti-church and anti-Christianity, that they need to think again about their arguments and think more critically and historically about what they are preparing to share against the church. We pray that we might not only learn, but might live what we are learning. Guide us, develop within us a deep love, an abiding love for your word, which is still an available and adequate lamp and light for a path and for our lives generally in all human communities. We pray your blessings, therefore, upon us. Rest our bodies, our minds in good sleep, 
and refresh us if it pleases you tomorrow, Lord, to go and share our testimonies by the way we live, by the way we share, and how we treat people generally. We ask these things for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Night, night, All right, everybody. Night, night. Have a good night.